our Bibles this morning to the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. We're going to begin with chapter 2 and verse 1 and cover chapter 2 today. It's only 15 verses, but uh, I find in these 15 verses a bit of a challenge, always have, and uh, the title incidentally is Church Conduct, how a church should be conducting itself. And Paul is writing to young Timothy, his disciple, his son in the faith, and he is telling him how a pastor should operate, how a church should be run, and how to raise that church up to know the Lord, and how to raise up leaders within the church. And so it's very valuable. Uh, it's one of the pastoral epistles, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Uh, Titus was another of the disciples of Paul and a pastor as well. So these become the church handbook. And I find chapter 2 uh, very interesting and very challenging. And it brings up the question for all of us, how will I approach the Bible? Am I to go to the Bible, like so many people do, and treat it like a smorgasbord? You ever go to a smorgasbord? Uh, I always wanted to marry a Swedish girl who would make a smorgasbord. And then I realized she probably wouldn't do that anyway, and uh, you couldn't have smorgasbord all the time. Who knows what a smorgasbord is, anyway? <laughs> it's a big, long table with all sorts of food on it. It's Swedish and uh, a lot of herring. Nothing like herring at 7 o'clock in the morning to get you started, huh? And uh, you have a choice of this or that, and you go and you pick what you want. And many come to the Bible and say, gee, I love this 23rd Psalm, the Lord's my shepherd, I'm going to pick that. But I want to do uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 because there's some things in there that I just don't want to have to do or I don't agree with. So we have to make a decision in our minds of how we're coming to this book. Is it a smorgasbord kind of an experience where I pick and choose what I want? Or do I take it as the infallible, inerrant, complete word of God to be submitted to whether I agree with it or not, whether I understand it or not, this is God's word to me, and I must submit to it, and when I do, I will do well. That's the choice we have to make. Uh, this church believes in the latter approach, not the smorgasbord approach, and as you do that, it forces you each and every day to submit to it and say, Lord, I don't understand it or I don't agree with it, change me. And with that in mind, there are a couple of passages here that I've had to struggle with over the years, and maybe you have as well. And these struggles help to strengthen us, to make us realize we are not God. It is not up to us to run our lives or speak for God. We must let God's Word do that, and then we submit to God's Word. Amen? So with that in mind, let's ask the Lord to help us. God, help us now to really, really understand your Word and to submit to it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, the uh, point here he's making is that uh, in church conduct, the ordinary local fellowship, uh, there is an importance of prayer, which is very, very important. We all agree with that. And then we get into this controversial matter that a lot of churches have trouble with, the roles of women and men in the church service. That's the main area of controversy for so many. <laughs> And uh, let's begin with uh, some neutral ground, chapter 2 and verse 1. He's talking, first of all, about the need for prayer in the church. Prayer is not really just one of the activities of the church. Uh, it is the foundation of it. Prayer is the absolute foundation of our lives. It's the foundation of the church experience. Nothing is going to happen in the church unless there's a strong prayer life. And uh, when the Lord started this fellowship, uh, he told us we were to have three major services during the week. And one is to be prayer. Tuesday night is a gathering of people for prayer and praise and laying out of hands and ministering and learning how to minister. Uh, then, of course, we have Thursday night and Sunday, which are regular services. But prayer is extremely important. So let's begin with verse 1 and see what he says about the fact that, first of all, we are to pray for everybody. And then we pray for our leaders, and then we pray for salvation. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So prayer becomes the vital element in a church life. Individual prayers, corporate prayers. The late great preacher in London at the turn of the century, from the 19th to the 20th century, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, at a church of about 20,000 people in attendance and no microphone, incidentally, to communicate with them. And he had, uh, in the upper level, the main floor, his congregation. It was a huge, huge building. And in the basement, he had his furnace, his prayer furnace. He had people downstairs during the service praying constantly for the service and for the people. That was his prayer furnace at that time. We've always had our Tuesday night prayer service, as I mentioned, and recently we've been adding some uh, prayer power. This morning we added two more to the list. We now have 75 people who are receiving text and emails every afternoon at 4 o'clock as I give forth the six or seven or eight most pressing needs of the day, along with several praise reports. We are seeing miracles happening. We now have about seven people in the last two months who are walking around alive who, by doctor's accounts, should be dead. Miracles are happening. Not to mention the smaller everyday miracles of lives coming together, jobs being gotten, finances worked out, etc., etc. Prayer power. One of our ladies is on a morning prayer telephone team from 5 to 6 in the morning, and I think they meet again at night and uh, prayer power. I had a report from one of the ladies about another lady on the telephone praying about a need. Our associate pastor out in Schoharie Valley, Pastor Greg Z of Reach Out Fellowship in Cobleskill, had his daughter in a car accident uh, where the oncoming car hit a deer which went airborne and flew into the car of Greg's daughter, Wendy, and passed between Wendy and her son, Buddy. It landed in the back seat dead, leg, leg severed off. She has had a very serious concussion, or I mean a very serious trauma to her left eye, danger of losing the eyesight, but getting a little bit of improvement. But the prayer power that went forth was unbelievable. And one of those ladies reported that another lady in that prayer group, not our prayer group, but a related one, saw angels around the vehicle. Now I believe in angels. But I'll be honest with you, when I have somebody who sees angels, I think, well, maybe, not saying no, not saying yes, I've never seen them, so I don't jump to any conclusions. Well, who cares what I think? Buddy says that he knew there were angels around, and independently, his mother said, I sensed angels all around us. So the prayer power can be great for confirming wonderful facts like that. People coming together, ordinary people praying, and the power is unbelievable. If you want to be part of our prayer team on that, give me your email address afterwards. And if you don't get back to me, you simply pray, lift it up, email or text. We'll be happy to put you in touch with us. We've got folks in other states who are part of this team. It's just growing. It has grown probably 40, 50 people in just the last month. It's unbelievable what God's doing. And prayer is going to fuel your life. It's going to fuel the church life. And that doesn't discount the most important prayers. These are group prayers. But what about your own individual prayers? And God, will, God alone knows the power of that. Speaking of prayer, two places in Revelation that talks about what's going on when you pray. And this is a wonderful picture of heaven and it's going on right now. In the Old Testament, you remember the tabernacle and later on the temple? And you remember how the priest had to offer incense before God? Remember that? You know what that incense was all about? You have any idea what the incense was? It represented the prayers of the people. Revelation chapter 5 gives us a glimpse into heaven. Now when he, that is the Lamb, 
Jesus Christ, has taken the scroll, the four living creatures of the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Of the saints. Do you realize that your prayer, whether you're part of a morning <coughs> telephone call, prayer group or our texting email group or your own group or your own individual prayers, when they go before God, it is like incense before Him. And you wonder if you're bothering God or if He wants to hear from you. And that incense is the prayers of the saints. That's how much God really cares for you and wants you and wants me to pray. So we need to be very obedient to that and realize that what we're doing is vitally, vitally important to God and to those here. I'll give you one more reference. In chapter 8, when the seventh seal is opened up, uh, another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. That's not future. That's right now. So here these ladies are at 5 o'clock in the morning. Maybe they're still in their jammies for all I know. Trying to get the winkers out of their eyes, keep the, quiet, the pets quiet, on the telephone praying for needs. Not exactly a glamorous scene, maybe. But in heaven, those angels have that incense being offered up, and those prayers ascend before God, and all of heaven is attendant. Powerful? Nothing more powerful than prayer. So chapter 2, uh, verse 1, I exhort first of all, most important for church order, let's not talk about the pastor, let's not talk about the message, let's not talk about anything else. First of all, it's prayer. How is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? I had an email from out of town yesterday from a woman who asked, she was looking forward to going to her own church, and she said, does your prayer, does your church pray as a group? I can't wait to get to church and be part of the fellowship. Does your church pray as a group? That was important to her, to know about our prayer life. And I said, yes, we do. He talks about supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. And those are the different categories of prayer. Not major differences there, but supplication is really an earnest petition, isn't it? What does the word supplicate mean? Sit back with your feet crossed and a beer in your hand and watching TV? Are you supplicating? I don't think so. Now that's an earnest, earnest prayer. Maybe on your face, maybe on your knees, maybe walking, but you're definitely earnest in prayer. If not, don't waste your time. God doesn't want to hear from us if our mind is in Hawaii and our lips are just kind of blathering on. Supplications, really be serious. <coughs> Prayers is a general word which includes praise and worship. We had beautiful praise and worship this morning as we lifted that before God. Intercession, to go between, to represent. These prayer teams, you and your own walk, are interceding. Lord, I come in the name of Jesus on behalf of Sam. And I ask you to do this for Sam or that or for our country, what have you. You're interceding. We need somebody to intercede. My late mother, the most godly woman I ever knew, said, pray for this person. You may be the only person praying for that individual. Think about that. Most people don't have born-again Christians in their families. Born-again Christians are a very small percentage of the world's population, including this country. It's been numbered as low as 5% who truly are saved by the blood of Christ. That's a small percentage. Are you praying for somebody at work? Somebody who annoys you? Somebody who's got your attention in a negative way? You may be the only person praying for that individual. If you don't pray, will anybody pray for that individual? Very sobering, isn't it? And then don't forget the giving of thanks. Always say thank you, Lord. If you're raising children and you have children who have this gimme, gimme, gimme attitude, don't you want to hear a thank you, thank you, thank you now and then? 
You can always tell the bachelor, can't you, with these crazy, inappropriate illustrations. What kid ever says that? How many have had kids that said thank you? It's a wonderful thing. Okay, that's good. That's good. You taught them well. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done.